Yes, indeed. It is a brand new episode of Download This Show. He is the all-reigning technology editor. Why, when I introduce people, do I always make them sound like <laughs> Tolkien characters? Yeah, Matt. I sound like the king of the office now. Yes, Matt Hopkins is the king of technology for pedestrian. <laughs> Welcome back to Download This Show. Thanks for having me. God, I'm a professional. <laughs> Claire Riley is from the techn- technology website CNET, and she joins us also. I am here. That is correct. What a from the king of technology to Claire is also here. <laughs> well, I, I felt bad about over. De- okay. I'm delighted to be here, and I can't wait to talk about what we're talking about today. The world of the foldy phone is upon us. Uh, Claire Riley, please. Stop me from talking. <laughs> yes, it's the uh, it's the Galaxy Fold, and you're exactly right. It's not the Motorola Razor flip phone or the kind of clamshell phone of the late 90s, although, damn, I wish they'd come back. Mm. Um, it is a really gorgeous all-screen device. Uh, imagine a flip phone that is quite a skinny, tall smartphone, regular screen on the front, then you open it up like a book and it becomes a 7.3-inch tablet-style device. Uh, no seam down the middle, so Samsung obviously has a lot of manufacturing capabilities, so they've designed the flexible display that means the hinge is hidden and you've got all screen all the time. So that's actually why I want to talk about this, right? Because flip phones, yeah, okay, cool, interesting. But the fact that it's actually a bendable screen, that is genuinely new because they've had a prototype for this out since about 2011. But this is the first time we've sort of seen... We see prototypes all the time. And a lot of the time you look at them and go, nice video, never going to happen. But this time it actually looks like it is going to happen. My question is... What exactly would you use this for, Matt? So I think the the thing here is it's it's marketed as like you can you can still use your phone as a normal phone, right? Like you can you can make calls and you can send messages as as you know the the tall block of of black metal and screen that we we're used to now. But you can also um, fold it out into what almost looks like a small iPad. Mm. Uh, and from that, and I think the most impressive part of that is that if whatever you're doing on the front screen will automatically flip into um, that opened up view. So you'll get not only a bigger picture, but um, a lot of apps will now be um, optimized for that yeah. view. And that, that will give you new features. So for example, if you're using maps, on, um, on on kind of the closed view and then you flip it open, those that map will become bigger, you'll be able to do more with it, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's going to have like more functionality within that kind of flip open. I just don't know who they're marketing it to. Rich people. Yeah, because it's going to be expensive as hell. Yeah, I mean, it's funny though, because in the last few years we've has seen the rise of things like phablets and stuff like that where there's this ever-expanding array of mobile sizes available to you. So your phones, which gradually seem to be getting bigger, then you've got your middle size iPad sort of stuff. And I guess there is an argument that if you can create a device that can do two or three use case sizes at once, which is essentially what we're talking about here um, in the form of technology origami, there, there's a, there would be a market for that. It's basically like you, what you're doing is you're killing off an iPad mini market and a phone market and a phablet market in one product. Exactly right. And I think what we're seeing more and more of is that we don't just use our phones for calls and photos. We're taking them everywhere. Case in point, I was on my way here. I had Slack open messaging colleagues. I was reading some news stories. I was doing a million things on my device. you are so millennial. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I was just, uh, I felt like I was in an ad and all those speech bubbles of my text messages were popping up around my head. It was amazing. (laughs) Um, But what we've seen from Samsung is this move into towards uh, multitasking and productivity. So their note series with the little stylus, that's all about multiple apps on the one screen. I didn't realize how much I'd use that uh, having tried a note and then I go to a phone that doesn't have that feature and you're kind of like, I'll just multitask now. And you're like, oh. What does okay. that mean? The, the- so that means you can bring up two apps. So say you've got Google Maps as a good example and then you're sending an email. So I'll bring up Maps and I'll be able to swipe around, zoom while that's on the top half of my screen, send and type in the email in the bottom half of the screen. In the open view, of the Galaxy Fold, they're talking about three app multitasking. So you can have multiple things up. So the idea is that maybe this doesn't get rid of your laptop, but if you're the rich person who is flying somewhere and wants to be able to work on their phone, then maybe consume media and watch a video and then have maps and email and all these things open, you're kind of multitasking on that bigger display. And that's really a trend uh, that kind of 
inverted commas, form factor trend is really big in tech right now. I was um, at this big computer show last year in Taipei and it was all about form factor. Asus had this double screen laptop. So instead of the keyboard on the base, there was a screen there that had a digital keyboard on it. Mm. Um, uh, Laptops that have a little touchpad that has a screen in it. And we're going to see more devices. We sort of saw hints of devices that are going to be all foldable screen all the time. This is a thing I want to talk about, right? Because obviously uh, Samsung have sort of gone first to the market with something that's very big and showy and, and obviously designed for consumers. But do we think, who, who do we think it is is going to jump on that bandwagon next? Anyone with about $3,000 spare dollars? Yeah, 2800 at Translates yeah, too, yeah. yeah. Wow. So I think it's going to be... Um, I don't know. I think people that are, that are kind of early adopters will, will jump on that. And I think, but I, I think the thing now is people are much more inclined to kind of sit back and wait and see what happens. I think yeah. a lot of the times new technology comes out and it's a bit buggy. I mean, it looks great and it's impressive, but you know, it might not run as well as it should. Mm. Also, the, the apps to support. As yeah, as exactly. Especially yeah. The apps. Yeah. They're talking about devs needing to be able to kind of put the features into their apps. So obviously, Google with YouTube, Maps, things like that, they've gotten on board from the start, yeah. and they would have made sure that those uh, those big apps are functional on this device. But if you've got a particular app that you love using, maybe an Evernote or maybe a, um, I don't know if that's a particular example that works, but if you've got particular apps, you might not have the best experience and it could just open uh, with two versions of the screen or worst case, you know, the same screen on both sides of the phone doubled. So there's a lot of points about that. And I think Matt's completely right. You know, it's proof of concept, it's early adopters, it's people with the money to splash and say, this isn't going to be my three-year phone necessarily, but this is going to show that I'm at the forefront of tech. Yeah. Ultimately, I mean, it does feel like we are headed towards a direction where, you know, keyboards disappear and they are replaced by sort of touchscreeny sort of elements. Although I will say that if you're used to typing an enormous amount of time, the tactile element of, of keys is surprisingly important. I made the mistake of attempting to write a book on an iPad once and... Well, that book had a lot of grammar errors. <laughs> and I, 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 one of the other developments that we're facing at the moment is actually not just full bendy screens, but actually flexible and transparent screens as well. That's been something that's been sort of bubbling up over the last few years. My question with that, though, is what would you... Like, you've seen these videos of, like, screens that are, like, they look like they're on cellophane. What would you actually use that for? Well, I suppose this isn't necessarily about getting you the best smartphone. Um, we're talking about displays that will be everywhere. So as we move away from devices that are screen and keyboard, as they've traditionally been, because really think about the old desktop computer that you had, the original Mac or the original PC that you had in the family computer room, um, it was screen and keyboard. And while we've gone slimmer, while we've gone stylish, we haven't really changed the form factor. Mm. You talk about touch. I think we're going to probably start to leap over that soon and start to go towards voice interaction. So screens and displays that are everywhere around our home that can bring up information and visuals, but we only interact with voice. So it might be that something that wraps around a pillar, or it might be something that appears in your home and is super thin over a window. It might be something in your bathroom mirror, which we obviously saw a bunch of at CES this year. So those kinds of flexible displays. It's not necessarily about LG's TV that's going to roll away into a tube when you don't need it, though super cool. Um, I think it's about having displays everywhere in our life. So it kind of turns into a bit more minority report back to the future. (laughs) Everything always comes back to minority report. (laughs) Download the show is what you are listening to. It is your guide to the week in media, culture, technology. In studio is me. My name is Mark Fennell. Hi. Uh, And we have Matt Hopkins, who is the technology editor with Pedestrian and Senior... Redditor with CNET. Yes, very wise. Is Claire Riley. <laughs> hey, uh, coming up in March this year, you can expect to see two very big announcements from Apple, one of which is going to be a digital magazine store, and then they will have their answer to Netflix, a big streaming TV channel. They've been chewing up big-name talent over the last uh, couple of months, in fact, years, uh, to launch with. But I wanted to talk about what we can expect because we're starting to get these morsels about particularly the magazine offering. And they've actually offered a deal to magazine publishers, which I find an astonishingly bad deal. And so I'm curious to know what is going through the mind of 
Mr. Apple at the moment. <laughs> or Mrs. Apple. I'm, you know, I don't want to judge. Gavin J. Apple Gavin. sitting in his Apple Tower. Um, <laughs> yeah, so tell me about the new magazine subscription, What w- magazine offering rather. What, what do we know so far, Claire? So essentially it'll be like a Netflix for news. So imagine all of your favourite titles in one place. You might be able to flip through a monthly Vanity Fair and then jump over to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, sounds good in practice, all for hypothetically $10 a month, which saves you the $10 you're paying everywhere for your monthly subscription subscriptions and all the different titles. Uh, but of course, the deal you talk about is Apple wanting to keep 50% of revenue. And then the, the other 50% goes to all of the outlets providing the content and they can sort of split it up based on how much people are engaging with that content. Uh, of course, the likes of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times are slightly miffed about this because they are not new to this rodeo of tech companies saying, we'll be the platform you provide the content. We saw that with Facebook, Facebook obviously. Yeah. And they're saying, well, we've got teams of reporters. If you're just getting it into people's eyeballs, not something to be sneezed at. Why are you taking 50% though? So that's what's kind of slowing the deal down reportedly. But also organisations like, I mean, the New York Times is a particularly good example where they have gone hell for leather building up subscriptions and building up the, the value of their subscriptions, why on earth would a company that spent the last half decade like building themselves up as, you should spend money on this, we're important, why on earth would they then put themselves in this open slather network of where, where the content becomes essentially diffused by being on somebody else's platform? Why would Maybe let's take the New York Times out of it, but like why would any publisher agree to that, Matt? The eyeball things is, is the biggest thing, right? Like that that's that's the kind of um, the crux of it. But I think Apple in particular have got this this um, reputation of, of kind of being at the forefront of that kind of thing. And now that uh, iPhone sales are kind of slowing down, um, people are kind of touting their streaming service and this new service. They're becoming to be a the service company. Thing. Well, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're transitioning their business. And I think people, I think a lot of people are trying to get on board. But I mean, as you said, um, the Wall Street Journal and, and, and these bigger publishers, they, they've they been around the block before. They know what's going on. But I think to a smaller publisher, uh, maybe someone who's starting out or maybe someone who's looking to kind of break through or they're plateauing in their numbers, I mean, to them, it's probably... Um, a good thing to, to be able to get in front of more people, you know, as many people as they possibly can. Um, but yeah, I mean, the deal's horrible, like 50%. And and the biggest kick in the teeth of all is that the remaining 50% doesn't even go to everyone equally. It goes based on performance of articles. So if your article gets on to this service and then doesn't do as well, then you, you're only going to see like a tiny share of that profit. And then that starts to have an impact on newsrooms. I mean, newsrooms already think about clicks and they're already thinking about thinking about driving eyeballs, but Mm. the good newsrooms have a way of splitting up their serious news reporting and their feature writing from having to think so seriously just about clicks. But if it becomes, well, you know, we're not getting much money from Apple and that's, we've spent all this money on this deal or that's how we're trying to get in front of eyeballs, you know, that becomes quite problematic. And I I, I think, you know, you talk about, Matt, you talk about um, smaller organisations or maybe uh, outlets that are trying to get more viewership. But the problem is if they're smaller organisations, will their stories have as many reads as mm. the big expose that New York Times is dropping on Apple News? So it it's really interesting. I think it's another, we could potentially be about to enter that new phase of news that we saw was really turbulent around the Facebook times when their algorithms were changing all the time and it was affecting how traffic was driving to the site. And when you've got journos just working really hard to provide the content, but that feeling of, well, do the people reading it on Facebook actually know who the writer is? Do they know who the yeah. masthead is? Are they yeah. associating that? And that was the big problem with Facebook's instant mm. articles, for example. So Facebook launched this thing where they would essentially host the content and that it would load really fast within the Facebook platform. But part of the problem was that they also, you know, in an effort to perhaps make it look cleaner, they stripped back a lot of the sort of identity and branding, which if you are the Boston Globe or the Sydney Morning Herald or WA Today... That branding, you know, if you subtract that from the viewing experience for too long, you're actually diminishing the product because people, Mm. in order to survive, you need to have people associate 
that brand with the thing that they read that they just like. And that needs to be a continuing, developing, deepening relationship, preferably uh, with some cash. Right? <laughs> so, and that's what the New York Times has done exactly, so well. They've yeah. said that, like, we are the New York freaking Times, man. You want to read our stuff. You want to come to us and see that kind of, you know, the prestige that comes with that. And I've had the experience of people sending me links to stories like, oh, have you seen this? This is in the tech field. It's like, oh, hey, um, just so you know, that's another tech journal. Um, um, based in Sydney, who's taken my story and rewritten it and mm. not credited me. I know who was in that courtroom reporting on that case and there were only two of us and that writer wasn't in there. But we are kind of entering this era where that sort of uh, that journalism understanding and education isn't necessarily out there in the masses. But that becomes problematic when, you know, the New York Times or the Sydney Morning Herald, they have processes for vetting stories and verifying and fact-checking that uh, blotbought.com doesn't. But if everything looks the same, <laughs> oh, am I reading Blotboard or am I reading SMH, you know? I mean, Blotboard is great. Yeah, I mean, what a great title. <laughs> really gets to the heart of yeah. the issue. <laughs> but, like, you, you, if you strip all that out, what is the kind of news education that you're giving your readers? It's just, like diffused content on yeah. the internet. Hey, uh, the, that we'll find out more about that on, I believe, the 25th of March. The other thing we're going to hear about on the 25th of March from Apple is going to be their new... TV streaming service. Now, this one's interesting because uh, obviously Netflix have come to dominate the game in terms of global streaming. Overseas, there's Hulu. Locally, we have Stan. But now everybody is getting in on this. So uh, some of the big uh, movie studios like Warner Media, Disney, they're going to be launching their own streaming services overseas. No idea when they're going to come out here. But Apple is an interesting one because this is a tech company doing it and they've, you know, they've splashed some cash around. They've got some big name people. But how do we, uh, what do we know about what an an Apple streaming service is going to look like as distinct from what a Netflix would look like. How many details are there out at the moment from that? It's not a hell of a lot, really. I mean, there's, they've, they've got um, things like Carpool Karaoke. Um, which, Woo, I'm starting up for you that. Know, like, <laughs> there's only so far that's going to go. You can yeah. watch it on YouTube anyway. But um, I don't know. Like, I mean, they've, they've put a billion dollars into it. Like, that, that's a number I read somewhere. There's mm. a billion dollars that they've put into this. So you expect something pretty big and some pretty big deals coming out. And they've got some big names on board. So I'm assuming there's going to be some original content. Uh, and that original <laughs> content's going to have to be pretty pretty compelling to kind of pull people away or, or, or pull people like in addition to Netflix and, and Stan and all these other things that they're running. But what? maybe, oh, sorry, I was just going to say maybe to uh, to counter that, maybe they don't have to pull people away. Maybe the mm. whole point of Apple is that we've seen, you know, you chat to someone who has an iPhone or we kind of, you know, as tech users, you tend to be knowing what different devices do what. There are whole pockets of society out there that say, oh, you know, I'll just iMessage you. And it's like, well, I actually have an Android phone. And mm. they're like, oh, okay. And they think the brand is Android. Like, oh, Android makes your phone. I'm like, no. Um, the people that live really intensely in the Apple ecosystem, they are baked in. And yeah. so if you can get someone who lives there all the time, they have their Mac, they have their Apple TV, they don't have to go far or it's just pushed into their face, then yeah. you've got them there, you've got a passive audience. And that is such a good point because I don't think people fully always realise how much subtle changes in the way a technology company operates can impact the content they consume. And the best example of that is Serial, the podcast. A couple of weeks before Serial, the, pod, the blockbuster podcast came out, Apple disaggregated their podcast from the iTunes app and they made a separate app for specifically podcasts. And if you talk to the creators of Serial, they largely credit their success to the fact that all these people that had iPhones suddenly woke up, updated their phone and had this new app called Podcast that before was siphoned off in a, in a corner of iTunes. And suddenly that is a huge contributing factor to why Serial and, of course, podcasting writ large took off in such a major way at that moment, even though it had been around for years. Mm. And so those little changes can have a massive impact. And you have to imagine everybody that owns an Apple TV in particular or everybody that owns uh, an iPhone or an iPad, if Apple can effectively push that out to you. Now, granted, this is, this is going to cost money. It's not like the podcasting app, which was free. But you can imagine what a huge impact that would have on people's viewing. It's like, oh, I've already got an iPad. I'm going to sign up for my if I don't bucks. have to load Netflix and jump in and choose from Netflix, if I already have a device that knows what my habits are, that uses all my Apple knowledge and the fact that I'm baked in there and uses my iTunes preferences to kind of guess what kind of person I am and I go into Apple TV and four movies are suggested for me rather than having to sign into Netflix, mm. you can absolutely 
absolutely see how that works. I mean, it's it's so interesting how even just how you interact with the user interface. Netflix, for example, they will change the poster artwork on a particular title for a show you're watching based on your viewing habits. So they might have three versions of a poster that you see when you look up Shit's Creek or when you look up I'm literally not watching any other shows right now so I can't think of any other <laughs> examples. But that's amazing because that affects how you choose what you choose and they are tailoring it towards you. These companies know how to operate and they know you as a person as well. Mm. You raised an interesting point earlier, which is basically the, the idea that Apple is sort of pivoting somewhat to being more of a, a services company as opposed to what we've come to know them in the last decade as being a hardware company. You mm. buy your iPads, your, your iPhones, your Apple Watches and then fill yourself with regret because you bought an Apple Watch. <laughs> why is that happening? Like why is there that shift in, in, their, in their model? Right? People are bored, I think, of, of smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's like people are bored. Like, like, look at the last few apples. I mean, the, the the ten was great because I mean, it was you know this this new fresh screen thing without the home button. But really, at the end of the day, they just removed a button. Like, mm. and it was nothing, expensive, so not yeah, everyone could buy yeah, it. And yeah. it was hugely expensive. And like the features that they have been adding in the latter past the part of the last decade to smartphones across the board have been pretty boring. So sales are waning. People aren't gonna people aren't willing to to, to dish out so much money on on smartphones anymore. Um, um, and I think that's why you're seeing things like the foldable phone now because, you know, they have to do something different. They have to. And I think, I don't know, maybe it's easier for Apple to just say, well, we can we can do this other stuff better. We won't bother doing the hardware stuff anymore. Or we won't put as much effort into the hard, hardware stuff anymore. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's an easier thing to, to do, I guess. Mm. Have they sales, considered a foldy phone though? Yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> um, their sales declined by 15% in the mm. quarter to December last year, which was the first time they declined in a decade. So it's just been growth, growth, growth for Apple. But think about the iPod model, right? When they brought the iPod out, lasts pretty well. You don't need five iPods iPods. So no. you buy one, the, I guess the consumables, the Nespresso pods of the iPod world <laughs> are the tracks that you're buying. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how much you sell the machine for, sell it for 200 bucks. That's fine. If you can sell those Nespresso pod music tracks or let's work back to the original no, analogy commit, you're trying to make to the here. Metaphor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you can sell those for a decent amount, you know, as we saw $1.99 per track in Australia, that's going to bring in huge amounts of revenue. And it is something that people are on the hook for every single month. Download the show is what you're listening to. In studio is Claire Riley, Matt Hopkins, and my name is Mark Fennell. And do you know what 57 million people do? You know what 57 million people do? Swipe. They, they swipe, swipe either right or left, they depending swap. on their preferences. I was going to say it was something a lot more carnal than that. Oh, sure. oh wow. <laughs> Don't let me stop you. Yeah. Uh, you're both correct because <laughs> we are talking about Tinder. 57 million people use Tinder. It is the world's biggest dating app. But there's been an interesting story that's out, actually been published in Vox about how the algorithm that fuels so much hooking up all around the world, exactly how it works and what's going on underneath the surface. So... To start it out for me, Claire, how does Tinder work? Okay. Well, I'm obviously pretty up on the dating scene. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm married and I'm very boring. But um, Tinder essentially, 57 million people use it. It serves you up people who are in your area. If you swipe right across the screen, it's like, I like them. If that person already likes you, you'll get a match. Or the next time they see you on the screen and they swipe right, they'll get a match with you. So the idea is it's finding people who you're similar to um, and hopefully that person has a photo of themselves standing on a cliff or with a tiger or, you know, looking super skinny at the beach. Are you sure you haven't used it? (laughs) Yeah, right. Sound like you have. But this algorithm is essentially... Anything that can be appified is just a technological version of what happens in the real world. So imagine that the hottest people get invited to the best parties and they meet the hottest people. That's kind of how Tinder works. Yeah. The people that have the most swipes, the most positive swipes on their profile get served up higher in your feed. And if they've got more swipes from other people who are swiped well, then they will come to you more quickly. Super interesting. It's a basic premise, but then from there, there's all this other stuff that happens about how it's served to you, whether you're actually matching on things like my personality and the stuff I like. Eh, no, it's <laughs> like, are you hot? Are you getting swiped on? Then cha-ching. So hot on up. hot does work. Yeah, hot on hot. There are some controversial elements to Tinder which come into play here. I want to ask you about um, super likes. Tell me what super likes are and, and, and I guess how they feed into the, that 
that subterranean algorithm. Yeah. So the super like um, bypasses the algorithm altogether. Um, but basically what a super like does is you can swipe up to super like someone. And what that does is when that person um, comes across your profile, a little star is on is on it, a little blue star I think it is. Mm-hmm. is it may shock you to know that I've never used Tinder. So We are literally the three worst people. <laughs> you knew that you yeah. swiped up. I was like, there's an up oh, There's an yeah, up. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so basically what that signifies to that person is that they've already liked you and they've like, it's kind of like a, they really like you. So they want you to know that they've liked you. Um, and that gives them the option to say, well, Hey, I like you too. It's it's kind of like a way of, I don't know, maybe buying someone a drink at the bar. Like like that's, that's maybe the best real world example I can, I can use. I think you can pay per use of the super like, but you can also pay to boost your profile so that for a limited time, you'll come up higher in the rankings for people in your area. So even if you're like batting on a low average, you can pay, which I guess is like being at the bar and having the really fancy gold Rolex and kind of being a dud, but people might look at you. The Mm. internet is filled with conspiracy theories about ways you can game Tinder. After having looked underneath the surface, are any of them actually true? (laughs) <laughs> One thing it does well, that, that, that I've seen a lot is that if you swipe less, you get more because, of, uh, like, you know, Tinder, Tinder really gives uh, gives a crap about, like, meaningful connection, right? So they um, they will, I guess, sort accounts higher based on whether they're sharing numbers with other people, having conversations, as opposed to someone who's literally just swiping right furiously on everything. Which is what I've seen people do. I, remember, yeah. I went to uh, a Bucks party once and I just saw this guy and he just like, he was sitting there, which by the way, super social to, thing to do, <laughs> just sitting there swiping right and he just looked at me and went, it's a numbers game, mate. Oh, <laughs> is it? Yeah, Classic. You know, it Classic. Everyone's got their theory about how yeah. it works. But I mean, if you think about how the basics of that platform, right, if the better people air quotes, better people are getting served up first, the more you swipe right, the worse the candidates are going to be. And they mentioned this in the Vox article, that you keep swiping right, it's going to be people that are less likely to be matched to you, that they're going to be a bit more like... Got, got some more city miles on them. I guess that's a polite way of saying it. Um, and you're going to have fewer options. So if you are feverishly swiping right constantly, you are getting down to the hundredth, thousandth option. Did you really need to say no to that person who was 13 who you thought was a bit rusty looking? Maybe actually just go back because it'll start bringing back those first people or the people that you've been on dates with and you've rejected. But also that signifies to Tinder that like, because that's what a spam account would do. Yeah. Because yeah. apparently it's, it's just filled with like spam as well. Like, or, you know. I'm shocked. If, if, <laughs> if it gets to that point where you're swiping, swiping it's going to put you with those other people. So it puts your profile lower. So you're better off uh, liking less or liking, you know. Be pickier. Be pickier, yeah. yeah. And yeah. hotter. Be pickier and yeah. be hotter. This it's is my takeaway. Very and, important things. And the gaming theory, um, there was one psychologist, they mentioned the article, that says you're only capable of making choices between nine things. After that, your brain just kind of fritzes out and you're not really making an, an informed decision, mm. which is absolutely Mr. Old Swipe a lot. He's not <laughs> seeing those faces. He's not looking. He's just like hot, hot, no, fugly, whatever. <laughs> so are you actually looking at that person? Choose, they say, choose nine people. Um, get to the point where you're messaging a couple, you might rule some out, that person's a weirdo, that person has a nose ring or a facial tattoo, done, Um, (laughs) and then pursue those leads and then maybe build up to another nine but never have more than nine people on the go. Also, as someone who is (laughs) terrible at dating and doesn't understand how any of the social mechanics of our society work, don't be dating nine people. Don't get yourself into a position where you have to wear different outfits and be in your own kind of sitcom because you're like, is it Gary or Lance tonight? I don't remember. Is he in financial planning or is he a real estate agent? You're just going to walk yourself into a terrible yet hilarious situation. All right. There is lots more of this in the podcast of Download This Show. That's why we call it Download This Show and you can find it right now on wherever you get good podcasts. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.